Well, as we um, move along and we're getting to the end of our Believe series, have you ever thought about this? God is far less interested in your results than the person you are becoming. I want to say that one more time. God is far less interested in your results than in the person you are becoming. The, the thing is, though, many people in life have tried to substitute results for what they've lacked, where they are lacking joy, where they are lacking in relationships, where they're lacking in character. They try to say, look, here's what I got. Here's what I've done. Here's what I've accomplished. Look at my trophy shelf. Look at my house. Look at my savings. Look at my money. And all these results is trying to fill in something that's a far deeper issue that God's concerned about. Not what have you achieved, but who are you becoming? You know, this fall has been in this final path of our belief. Um, we've been asking this question, who are you becoming? And this is really a series about Christian character. Another way to ask this is, are you displaying the virtues of a soul that has been captured by Jesus? That, that's really the type of person we want you to become. Well, today we're considering another quality of our souls, and that is faithfulness. You know, when I think of faithfulness, certain images come to mind. The first one is dogs. I uh, appreciate the story that uh, Kim and uh, Kevin shared. Uh, they do have this incredible trait of loyalty. You know, I'm, I'm trying to stop this itch, but I can't help it. I, I have itches in my brain. I was sharing this with Brent Hudson, this story about this dog, this Sky Terrier, Bobby the Sky Terrier. Was, imagine, he sat on, on the grave site of his owner for like 14 years, you know. And Brent said, well, the problem was, he says, he says here's my reasoning. The problem is, is because they buried his bone in the coffin, and some, he was just waiting for someone to dig it up. Um, that's sick. That's Brent Hudson. That's the type of person I work with. Um, but, you know, speaking, though, of, of other loyal dogs, though, when we think about faithful dogs, he, an, another one is, abs, is actually the famous Japanese Akita dog known as uh, Achiko or, or Achi. Uh, Achiko would see his owner off to work. Actually, let's just bring up that picture of him if we can. So uh, there's Achiko. And uh, Chico would, um, was this purebred Akita dog uh, back in the 1920s and, uh, in, in Tokyo. They, that's where he and his owner lived. And they got into a habit where Chico would, would uh, go with his owner to the train station in central Tokyo and uh, see his master off. And then come back precisely at the time in the afternoon to pick his master up who'd come back from his work. Well, two years into doing this routine, um, the master, while he was away one day, took a cerebral brain hemorrhage, gone. Never, never returned. But a Chico would show up every day at the train station in the ensuing years. And this was in a day in Japanese time that they did not treat dogs kindly, but he would still show up. And apparently, seven years into him doing this, day after day after day, showing up at the train station, um, a newspaper picked up the story about Achiko and published it, and this dog eventually became a celebrity all over Japan. And people started to call him uh, Jukin, Chico, which meant Chico the faithful dog. Um, actually, there's a, a movie, uh, an American adaptation of this movie featuring Richard Greer in it uh, called Hachi uh, that features this, this, this whole story. But this is based on, this is the actual dog. And if you go, actually, if you go to the train station day in central Tokyo at that train station, they actually have a statue of this dog uh, there and people are taking pictures all the time of this of this faithful dog You know another image of faithfulness of course comes from a, one of my favorite movies that some people can't stand other people enjoy It's the Lord of the Rings. Uh, let's bring up uh, Samwise Gamgee there uh, Samwise was Frodo's friend and according to uh, the Lord of the Rings author J.R. Tolkien actually the hero of the entire story of Lord of the Rings is not Frodo is not all the other characters. Actually, the central hero is actually Samwise. And uh, maybe some of you younger people recognize him from Stranger Things now on that Netflix show. But uh, 
he, he was, he was the, the hero of the story. And, and actually in the movie, he, there, there's a part here where uh, Frodo is, is realizing the danger that's facing him to take the ring back to Mordor. If you don't understand that for reference, please I forgive me. But uh, he's got to take it back. He starts to realize how dangerous it is, and he doesn't want his friend uh, Samwise to uh, follow him. And so he gets in the boat, and he's taken off, and Samwise swims out to him, almost drowns. And, and he says, what are you doing, Sam? And Sam says, I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. And actually, in the literature itself, if you read in the novel, it, it goes like this. Go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. And Sam, of course you are, and I'm coming with you. And uh, that's a wonderful illustration of faithfulness. You know, go back. I'm going alone. Of course you are, and I'm coming with you. What, what, what a statement of faithfulness. You know, I think of, I think of these um, images about faithfulness, and I think we get inspired about faithful dogs and, for those of us who are into mythical literature, faithful hobbits, okay, but, but we'll leave it at that. But then, but then we think about faithfulness in, in real terms, in real life. And let's just bring up the next image. So there's Sears. And uh, this week, last week, 12,000 Sears employees. See ya. Oh, your pension? See ya. Oh, your health benefits? Oh, yeah. See ya. And there were employees there. I see people shaking their head. Yeah. There were employees there that were faithful to that store, to that corporation. And maybe over the last few years, as they, Sears was going through its reorganization, trying to deal with the new day, maybe they could have jumped ship, got to another store, got into another type of work, but they said, no, I'll stay faithful. Yeah, you're saying, and I'm sure some are saying, wow, faithfulness, where's, where's that in our, in our society in real time? And, and let's be honest, too. Here, 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 here we go. Um, let's go to the next image. Um, in Canada, people who are married in 2014, um, the statistics now are simply this. In Canada, 41% of people who were married in 2014, three years ago, 41% of them by 2035 will be divorced. 41%. And, 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 of course, we think about when, when um, people walk down the aisle, they've made vows of faithfulness. And yet, we know we live in a society that really doesn't take faithfulness, well, 41%, right? And we go, what do we do? How do we, ha how do we, how do we navigate that? So, so you see, the, the, tr the point I want to make is this, is that I think for a, in our wider culture, there's a folly of faithfulness that people uh, consider. Um, it's an inspiring ideal, but it's a fool's errand. Yeah, let's just move to that next slide there, because what I want you to think about for a moment is that we live in a culture, a wider culture, that faithfulness, I think, now gets bad press. Um, valuable employees. In fact, I, when I talk to younger generation employees now, they'll, they'll tell you that if they stay too long at one place, if they're faithful too long at one place, actually that will hurt them in their corporate climb, so to speak. The, uh, other employees will go, well, why didn't you move around? Why didn't you leave after three years, you know, and go on and have another experience and another? Well, why did you stay around? It's almost like, are you, are you really not that good? Um, staying through to the end is often seen as optional now. Being faithful to others who are beyond just your close family is not really considered wise because, you know, people are going to disappoint you and hurt you. You know, today's wisdom tells us actually the only time to be faithful is to yourself. Be faithful to yourself. In fact, we often don't value faithfulness because we see that it's often not rewarded. We fail to see how faithfulness has an intrinsic worth regardless of how others respond to this virtue. Can, can, I just want to pause on that idea just for a moment. We have to be careful not to become so friendly to the world's thinking at a moment like this. You see, we have to let go of this notion that a character trait is only good as long as we get rewarded for it. Did you hear that? So often we'll say, well, if, if I knew being faithful would get me a reward, I'll be faithful. Do you see how backwards that is? But a lot of people go, you see, there's no, there's no payoff in being faithful. And they walk away from faithfulness. 
You know, our challenge is to understand faithfulness neither as an inspiring idea for dogs or, and hobbits nor as a foolish idea for people, but instead to think of this as Jesus did and let it transform our thinking. So as we're going to think rightly about faithfulness and how it needs to be a virtue and a character in our life, we have to really begin, first of all, with the faithfulness of God. You know, faithfulness matters because we see it in the very nature of God. Uh, preacher Chip Ingram uh, wrote this in his blog. Uh, preacher Chip Ingram in his blog, Living on the Edge, describes God's faithfulness like this. Whether we're conscious of it or not, we all believe in someone or something to hold us up inside. And when that person or thing comes through for us, then life is good. But when that person or thing doesn't come through for us, then we experience a sense of anxiety, dissatisfaction, and ultimately despair. Now, here's the truth. There isn't anyone or anything that will come through for us all the time, 24-7, 365, except for God himself. You know, grasping God's faithfulness is grasping how he has revealed himself in very two simple ways. And it's there up on, on the screen. See, God's faithfulness means God says to us all the time, I do what I say, and I'm not going anywhere. I do what I say, and I'm not going anywhere. I don't have this verse up on the screen, but, but Moses talked about God's faithfulness 3,000 years ago when in Numbers 23 he says this, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? See, God does what he says he does. You know, God promised to Abraham that he would, from his family, have a nation. And from Abraham's family came uh, tribes, and from those tribes was birthed the nation that we now know as Israel. God promised a savior. God made that promise back in Genesis 3. That, that one would come and strike Satan's, you know, crush Satan's head. That, that a Savior would come, and it was promised all through the Old Testament. And we are celebrating Christmas next month because that Savior came, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God promised that there would be one who would take away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God. And, and while we were still sinners, we see Christ dying on the cross. God did what he said he was going to do. Jesus promised he would rise again. And now there's an empty tomb. God did what he promised to do. You know, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, and now we see lives transformed when people are filled by faith with God's divine presence in their lives. Faithfulness First of all is, I do what I say. I do what I say. And God has always done what he said he would do. You know, God's faithfulness, though, is also seen in when he says, I'm not going anywhere. You know, you know God's faithful presence is heard throughout Scripture, where he will not leave us or forsake us. King David said, I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Jesus said, you know, I'll be with you to the very end of the ages. I, I mean, faithfulness means God saying to us, I'm not going anywhere, Dave. I'm not going anywhere. You know, in all those times, I find this. Isn't it interesting, and something we're thinking about, that the times we experience God's presence most vividly and we desire it the most is when we are either doubting or weak or tempted or when we sin. And in all those times, if we listen, we can hear God saying, I'm not going anywhere. Are you right now stretched thin with doubts? Well, well, look out at God's creation and see how it reveals the presence of God. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Are you feeling right now weak and discouraged and overwhelmed? Well, when the apostle Paul was weak, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. In response, Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ may dwell in me. 
You, you know, it's sad that often we default to the belief God isn't with us when we're struggling and weak. Can I tell you something? Just the opposite is true. God is saying when you're weak, I'm not going anywhere, Dave. You know, are you tempted? You know, no temptation is overtaking you, we read in Scripture, except what is common to man. But I love this next part. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll provide a way out so you can endure it. Are you saying right now, I just can't, I can't overcome this temptation? Well, God's faithful. He's saying, I'm not going anywhere. I'll, I'll be with you through this. But have you sinned? God, again, shows us his faithful presence. Our natural reaction when we blow it is to run and to hide in shame. We feel so bad. But God promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Oh, there's that word again. He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And, and I love what we read in the Old Testament. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for all the wrong we do. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank God for his faithfulness. God saying, I, I do what I say, and I'm not going anywhere. Now, now, now here is where we're going, if you haven't caught it yet. That when we talk about the faithfulness of God, well, it's a big deal for him. It's at the very core of who God is. God is faithful. We, we just sang about it. In fact, from a Christian perspective, we can go to bed at night not worrying about if the cosmos is going to spin out of control because it's in God's hands. And we can wake up every morning and we can almost take it for granted. Well, it's another day and the sun is risen and gravity is still working and the birds are still chirping. And guess what? God holds that all together Every day, morning by morning, new mercies I see. And, and, and faithfulness, therefore, is a big deal to God. And if faithfulness is a big deal to God, it should be a big deal for us. You know, as we think about this, I think about what it says. Actually, we could go to that um, verse in Ephesians 5.1. Uh, it, it says this. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. So if God is faithful and we're going to follow his example, we should be, what? Faithful, right? It, it, you're saying, wow, that's, that almost makes sense, Dave. That, that almost makes a connection. Like, faithfulness should be a quality in our life as well. Well, let's, let's talk about the faithfulness in me and faithfulness in you just for just a, a couple more minutes. See, faithfulness in me, how does, that, how's that, how does that live out in my life? How does that live out in your life? Well, well, if there's faithfulness in you, guess what? You're the person who will do this. You will say, I do what I say. I, I do what I say. I, I, when, when I say something, you can count on it. My words have weight. I, I'm not going to try to backstep. I'm not going to try to manipulate. I'm not going to try to duck and dive. When I say something, I mean it. I keep my word. When I make a promise, I follow through on my promise. And that is, again, one of the ways we need to demonstrate faithfulness. In fact, I understand that faithfulness for me, I do what I say, means that that now, all of a sudden, my words and action go hand in hand. You know, let's just stop for a moment and, and grasp this about I do what I say. Living out my faith is a recognition that faith demands effort. Did you, did you catch that? Faith demands effort. Dallas Willard makes an important distinction when it comes to faith and works. He has a slogan that goes like this. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. You know, you, you've got the gospel all wrong. You've got your relationship with God all wrong. You think you've got to keep earning God's favor every day. You never can do it. For by grace, we're saved. God, God loved us even when we were still sinners. But, but God does expect us to put effort into our faith. 
that we need to let our words and our actions come together. I do what I say. And we begin to grasp the fact that it will take effort to live out how God wants us to live in his kingdom. So when Jesus talks about kingdom of God living, it means that when we, we have to walk the second mile for someone, we have to walk the second mile. When we have to give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, we give a cup of cold. We do what we can. We offer what we can. We serve where we can. And, and, and we show up to love each other because Jesus says, you know, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as, as much as I have loved you. Well, how do I love you? Well, well you, you suddenly realize I have to do what I say if I'm going to love you. I have to show up. I have to put my faith and my action together. That's what faithfulness looks like. I do what I say. But faithfulness also looks like in your life and my life where you say this, I'm not going anywhere. I am not going anywhere. Have you ever wondered when people need your presence the most? Have you ever wondered that? Well, guess when they need your presence the most? Right now. There could be someone behind you, in front of you, next to you, or somewhere diagonally across the room from you who are thin, on the, thin in their life right now, in their faith because of their doubts, who are feeling weak and overwhelmed or discouraged, or who are struggling with temptations or have sinned, and they're feeling ashamed and bad, and they're hoping somebody in their life will show up right now. Isn't it interesting that, that we need, those are the times when we need God the most, and those are the times when we need one another. Now, who here hasn't felt filled with doubts at times, felt overwhelmed, felt discouraged, felt tempted, or have sinned? So, so, you're, saying, so you're probably saying, well, Dave, that means then that probably somebody needs me right now where I can live in front of them and say, hey, guess what? I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. You see, we need one another. We, we need the faithfulness from each other. We need it, we need it in, our, in our, our, our friendships. We need it in our marriages. We need it in our workplaces. We need it, we need it in our church family. You know, I, I remember when... Um, I got five minutes. I can tell the story. I think in ninety seconds. Um, I, I, I think about when we went through a very difficult time here about nine, ten years ago. When we we're going through a bunch of transitions, and when you go through a bunch of transitions as a church, and the same thing happens to families. It happens at work. Happens in other places. So it's not unique, but it did happen here at the Journey Church. We were going through a lot of big changes, and during those changes, um, there was a lot of conflict. And, and, and as I look back 10 years later during that whole time of conflict in our church, the, the thing I realized what I needed most from other people as a pastor was I just wanted people to stay faithful. I wanted faithfulness to be a quality in their life. And the thing is, is that, that, that I remember going actually, uh, I actually ended up going to a counselor for a while to just sort of process all that pain and anger that I had as I went through that time of conflict myself. And she said, Dave, you know your biggest problem is that you come across like you have Teflon on you. Like nothing bothers you. Hey, yeah, go ahead. No, not a problem. Ding, ding, ding. Everything just falls off you. And the truth is, she says, you're just as human as everyone else. You're just as hurting as everybody else. And what you, and, and what you need to let people know is what you need. And here's the truth. A lot of us walk around, I think, with this Teflon on us. Where we think like, oh, they're doing okay. Oh, that couple over there is doing okay. Oh, that guy back there is doing okay. Oh, that young couple just got married is doing okay. And no one's doing okay. We need to be faithful to each other. We need to say, I'll do what I say, and I'm not going anywhere. You imagine how powerful that is? If people can sense that from you, I'm not going anywhere. You know, <coughs> as we think about this word for faithfulness, it's built on the word faith. It means the active idea 
of, of this word is that you believe, you have faith. Faithfulness is sort of the passive idea that you are one who can be believed in, that you're one who's trustworthy. You're one that, that people can say, I have faith in you. What, what, a, what, a, what a powerful legacy to have in your life if people say, this was a person who I could have faith in. This is a person who I could trust. I just want to end with one of Jesus' stories about what the kingdom of God was like. When you read the gospel, Jesus is always trying to say, here's what it means to live under, under God's way, God's rule, God's kingdom. And so he goes, here's what the kingdom of God is like. I know you've heard this story, but I love telling it because it's always worth repeating. It's the story about the master who was going to go on a long journey. He had three servants. And, of course, he, he had bags of gold. And he said, look, I'm going to be gone for a long time. While I'm gone, please, please get to work, you know. And so he gave one servant five bags of gold. He gave another servant two bags of gold. He gave another servant one bag of gold. And after he came back, the, 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 the first servant who had five bags of gold had doubled it to ten bags of gold, had invested it, had worked it, had, had been faithful to the task at hand. The, the second servant took the two bags of gold, doubled it, made it four bags of gold. The last servant had just buried it and did nothing. And, and, and of course, what happened to the last servant was he was called, you wicked, lazy servant, and he was cast out. But what I want you to focus in on is the response of the master of what he said to the first two servants. And here was the phrase, well done, good, and you, you, guess, you can guess the word? faithful servant. And listen to this. Listen to this, people. Listen to this, fellow Christians. You have been faithful with few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You know, Jesus' story tells us many different things. But this is one I want you to really grasp. I want you to grasp it if you're a young person. I want you to grasp it if you're a middle-aged person, if you're an older adult person. Jesus is saying this. When you are faithful, when you're faithful to God's call in your life and you're faithful to others, it opens you up to opportunities where God wants you to make a difference. But you will never experience those things if you don't say, God, help me to be faithful. Help me to be trustworthy. Help me to be a person who says, I do what I say, and I'm not going anywhere.